Hi everybody, I am Jen Johnson and this is Thought by Thought Healing where I talk about everything related to chronic pain, chronic symptoms, all the things. I talk about this from a Christian perspective, so if that's important to you, then you are in the right place and you should subscribe. It is through recent neuroscience that we now understand chronic pain and how we can begin the process of healing from it and reversing it. And so today I have the honor of interviewing Jim Prusak, who is the pain PT. He has a fantastic YouTube channel that if you haven't already checked out, you definitely should. He has a way of describing things that's really helpful and kind of brings it all together. So I'm going to read you a short bio on him and we will go from there. So Jim Prusak is a licensed physical therapist who specializes in mind-body treatment for chronic symptoms in the body. Jim has been practicing for over 20 years and has learned personally from some of the top people in this field, such as Howard Schubiner, Dr. David Schechter, Alan Gordon, Laura Murr Mosley, Georgie Oldfield, and others. Jim has overcome his own chronic pains and chronic anxiety using this approach, and he continues to learn more every day as he helps people to regain their lives through this work. So today's episode kind of goes in two different directions, and the first is going to be geared towards more people who are in the beginnings of their journey and are trying to understand what things actually cause pain and what things don't things such as uh, repetitive stress injuries and um, core stability and things like that that traditional physical therapy looks at a structural approach and he talks about it from a different angle. The second half we get more into emotions and how to lean into those which is the healing process as those of us who are in this TMS uh, mind-body healing journey we know that we need to get to the emotions feel them name them know them and let them be released and so the second half of this is about that. Um, so I hope you enjoy if this is helpful for you definitely like it give it a thumbs up and send it to a friend Um, yeah and without further ado here is Jim and I will see you guys next week bye all right everybody here we are thank you Jim so much for taking the time to be here with me today how are you? I'm really, really happy to be here. Good. Can we um can we just start by you telling us a little bit about yourself? If you were listening to this, what would you want to know about you? Yeah, well, um, I'm a physical therapist. So I've been a PT for 20 plus years now, I think 23, 24 years. And um, I grew up on the East Coast of the US, New Jersey. And um, I went to school throughout the East Coast and ended up in San Diego and been living here for over 20 years now. And weather is so good that I can't leave. So I'm, I'm stuck here, but I love it. Awesome. Um, and so I've been working as a PT for a long time and treating a lot of just physical conditions in the body, working mainly in outpatient centers. So orthopedic conditions, musculoskeletal problems, pains, things like that acute pains, subacute chronic pains. And, you know, when I first started my career, it was just like all about, you know, structure and Mm -hmm. physical treatments and learning manual therapy. I went to Australia and I've shared this story probably before. I went to Australia to learn a manual therapy degree in um, 2002, which was awesome. But I came out of there thinking about psychosocial stuff more than ever. So I was learning about the physiology of pain, had some mm-hmm. great teachers, great teachers, a guy named Peter O'Sullivan. Not many of you may have heard of him, but he's kind of in the league of Lorimer Mosley. Mm-hmm. Um, people have heard of. So he really changed his way of approaching back pain. So when I was working with him, we were studying um, core stability and strengthening your core. We were measuring the EMG and the core muscles, and people were lifting things, and we're seeing if it was working or they were activating. Well, since all those studies that he did he did numerous studies he threw all that stuff in the trash can and he's went in a different direction because he realized the research wasn't supporting it so he started a thing called cognitive functional therapy um do you have a question yeah i do yeah (laughs) Um, his research i just want to i just want to be explicit about this the research wasn't supporting what the research wasn't supporting the idea of core stability yeah Um, in fact, what he was teaching now is quite the opposite. It's like learning to relax these muscles because they're too tense and tight and protected and guarded from stress. 
-hmm. And so he went on to form a thing called cognitive functional therapy, did a lot of research around, around not quite going into emotions, but going into beliefs and the way we hold our bodies and getting people to relax, um, telling people they're fine and, and really challenging people to do things. I remember going to a training with him and the lady had a hip pain and he had her hopping on the hip during the session. Like, and she had some bad pain and the pain was decreasing she just by messages of safety and reassurance that there's nothing wrong with her hip, you know, breaking down fear, um, giving good evidence, relaxing the body because when there's pain, there's, there's guarding and protection. So yeah, I don't want to go off on the tangent, but he was a big influence to me. Yeah. Um, I came back from that and really dove into the stuff with Sarno and Schubiner and Dr. Schechter and George Oldfield. I'm a super practitioner. So I did a lot of trainings since then, Laura Mosley. Um, so my background is kind of diverse, but it's come from a physical background, which is kind of cool, and then gone into this psychosocial background. So I meld the two of these things together. I noticed you didn't say biopsychosocial. Yeah. Was that on purpose? Uh, maybe it was a Freudian slip, but I didn't <laughs> say it on purpose. But there's actually some talk of getting away from that term even because it doesn't encompass everything. But yeah, it is biopsychosocial. Um, I think the way I see it is I'm looking at stress. Yeah. Is it is it was it physical stress that's causing your problem, or is it more emotional, um, psychological stress? And yeah. sometimes that's a nice way to delineate this: that if you load your body excessively physically, or you jump off uh, uh, something and you land and it's too high, well, that stress in your leg is going to break break your femur, let's say, or you're going to twist your knee from excessive force. So that's excessive physical stress. But what people don't realize, and you know this, is that excessive emotional stress yeah. causes the very same pain that the structural stress can cause. And that's where people don't believe that or don't think that's real or that's possible. They think, oh, yeah, stress can, I, I agree, it can make it feel a little worse or something, but they don't think it can cause or be a main driver of their symptoms. Yeah. So going back, there's a lot in there that I do have questions about, but going back to you moving from structural, um, that bio approach into mind body medicine, what was it that training around the core stability that kind of was the starting point for that? And, and how did that, how did that transition go for you? Um, yeah, lots of questions in there, but just start yeah. with that. Oh, I think it was a combination of I, one of our professors in Australia was this kind of crazy Australian guy, but he was a brilliant guy. He was a neuroscientist and he taught us the, 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 the physiology of pain. Yeah. The way he taught it was not just like, you know, these receptors and neurons in your body and spinal cord and all this stuff. He was talking about a whole system, you know, that it wasn't peripheral, but there's central mechanisms mm -hmm. going on in your brain. Mm -hmm. So he really opened the eyes to me. And at the same time I found Sarno and, and by the way, I was going through my own stuff too over these years, own chronic things, chronic anxiety. So I was interested from a personal level, but on a professional level, I was seeing a lot of patients who weren't getting better. And I was taking all these courses and doing manual therapy and do these exercises. And I'm like, it, it's not working. Yeah. And so I had one patient one day that also opened my eyes. She was came up with bilateral RSI, wrist, shoulder pains, a whole bunch of stuff. And she was really, really anxious, really, really scared. And I remember just sitting there and saying, you know what? I said, you're fine. I said, you know, yeah, you got some tender points. You got some stuff. But I said, you're, you're reacting way worse than what this is. I said, this is just some muscle strain. It's, it's going to go away. And she was so terrified. I didn't realize it that she said to me, Jim, <clears throat> I was scared I was going to die. Yeah seriously told me she said, I was scared that, that this was it I was going to die and just simple reassurance to her within I think it was a week or two I got a call from the doctor and he's like what did you do to her she's so much better and I was wow. like I didn't do anything to her I didn't even barely touch her I just reassured her. I said she was going to be all right and so just that simple shift in that person and we see that with Sarno as well, with some of his books and stuff can ship people. It really opened my mind even more to say, wow, okay, there's there's something here. This, And I kind of knew it already, but 
even even more solidified that. Yeah. Yeah, that's just amazing. You mentioned earlier this idea of, of being self-protected, which is interesting because it's it's something in our culture that's that's valued, right? Self-protection. And yet when we have MBS or TMS or whatever you want to call this, it's really not helpful. Uh, can you just talk about that? Uh, what's happening happening physiologically when we get in that state? Yeah, so typically we're looking at fear. Um, as a, we think of the word protection, we're trying to protect ourselves. So we think of the emotion of fear or anxiety. So we're in one of those states of uh, being worried, fearful, anxious, concerned. And this can be on a subconscious level too. So it's not just conscious. Yeah, The body will go into these protective mechanisms of guarding, of tensing, uh, of tightening, um, around pain, around painful areas, around areas where you've been hurt, either physically or emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they can stay contracted or constricted. They can stay like in that mode. And that's when things are locked up. Um, things aren't moving. They feel stuck in the body. They feel like it's trapped. People say, I feel like it's just there. And it's, it's like a block in my body. Or, hey, the muscles just so tense. They work it out. We do trigger point release. And that was another thing, too. I would do all these things. I would you know, mm -hmm. get on the pelvis, uh, do deep trigger point work. I did a ton of manual therapy work for years. So I, I knew a lot of this stuff. And I was like, man, people are coming back with these same patterns over and over again. It would return. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Like, if I do this, it should get better, right? And if I do it six, seven, eight times, well, we should see a result. And you weren't seeing results. That's when you go to the brain nervous system, right? There's a different component that's protecting and guarding, and that's your brain. The yeah. brain is in the protection mode because of a perceived danger. It's yeah. protecting you. So sometimes they don't turn off these things in the body, and that's why the symptoms stay there or they keep coming back in these people. When you say it doesn't turn off, do you mean that the, the brain doesn't go back into the the parasympathetic it's it's just always engaged in the sympathetic yeah it's it's always engaged and, and maybe it's engaged from a trauma um from something that happened to them a big a big thing or maybe they're continually anxious all the time maybe they're under current stress and never really get their system to relax enough mm -hmm. maybe they're worried about the condition so there could be a lot of reasons but at the end of the day the brain is still in that mode of um, a stress reaction mode of protection yeah okay so we've we've talked about rsi repetitive stress injury core um we haven't talked about ergonomics but i'd like to throw this in there too um and there was one other you mentioned i can't remember what it is now but so what's your stance on those things now especially rsi i mean i i know what you're gonna say but but i want to hear um because it's so easy when we're typing and I have pain in my wrists and it's only when I'm typing. So it's so easy to associate it with repetitive use or I, I was and am again a social dancer, West Coast swing dancer and your feet hurt. So then you think, well, my feet are damaged because I use them too much, right? I, I'm on my feet too much training, et cetera. So, where do you land on that? And how do you explain that? Yeah, well, I actually worked with that because I did workers comp for a number of years. And I actually was a, uh, I did ergonomics specifically. And I worked in a call center for about a year. So I would go around in this massive call center, look like a Costco. And I would go around to people's desks and, and look at their ergonomics, how they were sitting, how they're using their computer. So I saw it firsthand. And um, I may have shared this story a long time ago in another podcast or something but again one of these aha moments like that lady who reassured her there was a guy working there and he had all the wrong postures you could ever imagine uh, he was slumped down in his chair so low his head was resting in the back of his um, backrest and his arms were out like this and he was just like i call him a low rider he was just way down in the chair and he was and he could you know looking way back at the screen yeah. and i was like oh man i gotta go talk to this guy He's probably a mess, right? Yeah, yeah. I started talking to him, and I was like, "Hey, man, I'm like, I'm like, is that comfortable?" He goes, "Yeah, this is great." He goes, oh, "This is really comfortable." I go, "Do you have any pain anywhere?" He goes, "No." 
I feel fine. And I was like, what? I'm like, that is the worst posture I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. And he was just completely relaxed. And I'm sure he moved around at times, you know, and, but what I found was the people who were sitting so erect and straight and tense and proper and, you know, they were the, the more people who were having issues. And then when you ask them some questions about stress levels, they also had stress. And so there's a combination of those things that was causing their symptoms. So the repetitive nature of it by itself, um, we have a lot of good data on that too from studies that that's, it could cause something, I, I suppose, any physical load could, but how many millions of people are doing that every day with no problem? Yeah. And so it, it's like eating a food, you know, if everybody else can eat it, well, it's probably not the food, it's something to do with your system. Yeah. And so we get a lot of data. Um, I worked at the place where they did um, clothes cleaning. It was assembly line and the same thing, but shoulder injuries and people were working like mm -hmm. this. And I went in to change the ergonomics for them and, you know, try to lower the heights and things like that. But it was the same thing. Some people say, hey, Jim, I've been working here for 20 years doing the same thing. And I never had a problem until this body's used to that. No, And now why you have a problem? What's going on? Did you change the way you did your work? No. Are you doing the same amount of work? Yes. What else is going on? And so when you dig onto the surface and you say, well, you know what? I got this, I got a new boss and or I got these coworkers or I got stress at home. There's something else happening typically. And then when you look at it and you go, wow, okay, well, that's tensing up your body now. So now you're work doing the same work that you've always done with no problem, but now you've got a tenser, tighter body yeah, because of the stress. And then that's why the symptom starts. So yeah. It's not always that way, but it's very commonly that way, especially when there is no real injury uh, that you can put your finger on um, that occurred. Yeah. I have several stories of my own that concur with that. Absolutely. I even had, uh, I will not refer to them as a friend, but somebody in my life that would constantly critique my posture. Um, and I had a lot of pain at that time. And as soon as that person was no longer in my life, that pain, that specific pain, I still had TMS because I hadn't discovered everything yet, right. but it went away and I was able to just, I was able to just stand and just be and not worry about the critique. So um, that and also getting ergonomic like chair and um, cushions for my wrists and all that stuff didn't help at all. And then I discovered TMS and as I started doing all my, all the work, no longer do I need that chair, the the rest, you know, all that, all that stuff went away as I started to work um, with the brain. So yeah, amazing. Yeah. You're just a testament to it. And same with me, I had back pain for a long time and I kept, and I had it when I was in Australian school and I kept thinking, okay, I got to sit straight. Got to keep the lumbar lordosis. I got to activate these paraspinals, suck in my core. Yeah. And, and I would sit like this and yeah. I had more, I had more pain. And then yeah. when I started sitting slouch, like I do now, I had, there's no pain. Um, and so if, if anybody, your listeners want to listen, go to watch Peter O'Sullivan. He was, again, my mentor in Australia. He's got a great video. I think he's got a couple hundred thousand views on YouTube. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but if you Google his name, Peter O'Sullivan, it's great. He takes a couple case histories. He talks about posture. He debunks all this stuff. It, it's about 15 minutes long. It's really worthwhile to take a look at it. Cool. Maybe I'll put that in the show notes. Um, for those of you who are listening and not watching, <laughs> as soon as Jim said that, I adjusted and leaned back and I even just feel better now just having this uh, comfortable, um, I don't know, demeanor. And and so that's the one thing that, that I've heard people talk about is we can correct, correct our posture, but more in a sense of assurance, um, confidence. Um, um, that's helpful, but it's not about the position of the body as much. It's not about the position. The body is built to move in all positions. There's no one correct position. Uh, like people with back pain say it's bad to bend over. No, it's not. That's why you can bend over. The body's built to bend over, lift something up. Studies coming out now showing you, and I taught this to people, patients for years, hey, bend your knees, squat. Don't bend over. It's bad for your back. Well, that's been disproven now. Wow. 
A lot of these things that have come that we thought were true are not necessarily true. Um, posture, um, the way we sit. Again, most of this stuff is too much tension, yeah. not weakness. Yeah. And, and the way we can we can debunk that even further is to say, let's take, and I did geriatrics for years too, so I worked with a lot of older folks for many years. And I would go, hmm, a person's so weak, they, they can barely get up, but there's no pain. Mm -hmm. So how does that make sense? And I would think, my God, what was I doing for all these years telling everybody to do these exercises to get stronger for their pain? It's good to be strong. Yes, you should be strong for your own body, you know, to, to, to have reduce falls when you get older, to just general fitness. But the relationship between strength and pain is, is not necessarily there. So shifting slightly um, with this idea of tension being in our bodies due to stress, and then we're going to the gym, we're working out. And I have a, I actually have a watcher question that I'm just going to refer to because it actually encapsulates what I wanted to ask. But she says, um, returning to exercise, I'm curious if it's safe, not necessarily to exercise because of pain, understanding the most chronic pain is neural pathway generated, but whether it's safe to exercise with increased muscle, muscle tension in the body. For example, is it okay to run on legs that are really tight? I know that this lady um, is just starting her TMS journey. Um, to healing. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's absolutely okay to do that. Um, it's just tightness, um, honestly. So there's no injury. Um, and a lot of people have tightness in their bodies. You know, when I would check people for hamstring lengths, um, a lot of men or people, they were so tight, but it doesn't mean they have pain there. Yeah. And so Stiffness, um, tightness. Um, there are some studies that actually show, like with marathon runners, that if you do a lot of stretching, they're more likely to have injuries. So okay. it's this thing that it's nothing dangerous. As long as there's no structural injury in your body that you know that has been damaged, you can proceed forward. And maybe you want to do it in a graded, gradual way to get mm -hmm. your confidence back. Mm -hmm. Yeah which is smart, I think, but you can proceed forward. Yeah, because you're trying to see it in your mind is it's fine, you're fine. Maybe there's some stress. You can work on some of these other brain strategies as well while you return to your exercise. Okay, good. Um, so, so speaking of the gym, I, I often hear gym rats, Pilates people, all of us saying these, these, this word of I'm, I'm listening to my body and what they mean by that is slowing down or, or not exercising as much and whatnot. And I think as, um, as we're looking at mind body syndrome, there, there's this uh, confusion around this idea of, cause we do start in a sense, we're listening to our body, but it's more about what is the emotion? What's, what's psychologically happening here? Um, and so what's what's your thoughts on on this when people are doing when they are working out and they're having soreness or what is is seemingly an injury from too many squats? Uh, what's your thoughts on listening to your body? Yeah, well, there is such a thing as listening to your body. Um, if you've loaded your body too much, which is out of the ordinary, meaning it's way more than what you've done typically. Okay. Uh, well, it's way more than ordinary. Intense then and you get some kind of um, reaction then maybe you want to just take it easy for a day or so um but it has to, it's common sense right uh if you go to the gym you never lift the weights and all of a sudden you do an hour of weightlifting you're going to be hurting so bad in fact one of my friends in physical therapy school did that and he never went back to lifting weights again uh-huh and it's just this idea that your body you do get delayed onset muscle soreness you do get some stiffness maybe or some pain even post exercise but as long as you haven't um, damaged anything, that should just recede or go down, and then you can resume again. Okay. So that's the general thing. If you're, um, you know, a lot of people I work with, um, they're doing very minimal things, you know, like very basic things that are very not putting any physical load in the body, like walking for five minutes, yeah, standing for 10 minutes. Those are very low load things for your body physically. Yeah. So in those cases, there's really nothing structurally going on. There is no, um, 
nothing physically you need to be worried about, but your brain can be kicking off a huge reaction to that because of central sensitization in the brain. Mm -hmm. So we have to distinguish between structural and then structural stuff versus brain, brain stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's make that transition then. Um, when, what, yeah. So now you are not working with the body in your own personal practice. You're not working with structural and we, you are working with mind body medicine. So what does that look like now for you? Um, and how are you, how do you approach that in your own work? Yeah. Um, that's a big question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I basically, again, the first thing I always do with everybody is I want to get a history of the person, you know, coming from a physical therapy background, we're trained in getting a, a history and initial assessment. So I do, I do want to look for structural things. If I, if there's something there, I want to know their history, your reports, yeah. give me everything you got, tell yeah. me your story. And the difference now is the story I'm trying to get, the history is very broad. It's not this about what happened to you, what you do. Start there, but then we dive into um, who you are as a person, you know, your personality, what happened to you as a child. Um, I screen for some of these things. Do you have anxiety, depression? Um, how do you deal with your emotions? Um, so I'm looking at all these different factors that the person could have. Hey, what happened? What else was going on in your life at the time the pain started or the symptoms started? Was there any stress, life change? Okay, we're, so we're looking for at a really broader picture to put the pieces together. And then from that point, once I can say, you know, I don't think this is structural because you had it for X number of time, there's a stre stress related cause, you have a history of these things, you've got some adverse childhood events, maybe trauma. So now we're going to shift to the brain. Yeah. We're not going to look at the body anymore from a structural point of view. Yeah. So you just said the word anxiety. And like we talked about before we started this call, I definitely want to talk about that. Can you just dive into what anxiety is and its role in this? And um, I think sometimes we get stuck in this process because we have a diagnosis of anxiety. So maybe just talk about whatever you're comfortable talking about around that. Yeah. Um, well, I can talk personally about anxiety because I've had really bad anxiety my whole life. Um, I didn't really even know it until it was probably in my 30s because I just kind of ignored it and it just went through life. But yeah. I really, once I recognized, like, oh, my God, I've been anxious my whole life. So I can speak to it. Um, the way I see anxiety is that it's just an exaggerated um, fear. So it's fear. It is fear. It's the same category. It feels like fear. It, serves the same purpose of fear but the difference between anxiety and fear is that anxiety is a, i would call it a false fear okay or what we call perceived danger not a real danger but your brain is reacting as if there was a real danger a real threat and it could be still reacting for many reasons but essentially the brain is kicking off that that response in your body of anxiety which could show up as classic anxiety like I feel very anxious, like you get my chest and I feel very shaky. I'm getting lightheaded, heart palpitations, anxiety attack, panic attack, or it can go into hundreds of symptoms in your body, mm. hundreds of physical symptoms. And that's where people get disconnected from that. That's anxiety, but anxiety can take that pathway. So it can come out in many ways. So we're trying to distinguish it. What is this? Is this an anxiety symptom? in your body now don't worry about the word it's just a word anxiety yeah. don't, don't worry about it. just like chronic fatigue is a word a label to diagnosis you can throw in a garbage can if you want because it's just about what you feel in your body and you might want to actually do that write it down throw it in the trash can <laughs> it's very yeah, throw these labels away i don't think the labels help no. You can go in another round and talk about it. I won't go too far off on the tangent, but the, the labels can become nocebos. And the nocebo mm -hmm. is the opposite of a placebo. It's where the word has a negative meaning to the person, and that actually amplifies the problem. Um, yeah. Lots of studies on these nocebos. But anxiety is just, again, um, it's something a lot of people have. It's number one, uh, you can say, and we call it mental health, but number one sort of brain thing that people have in terms of 
creating this in the body. Depression is number two. So millions of people have it. A lot of people function with it. There's even a term called um, high functioning anxiety that executives have that use that energy for their to power themselves forward. So it's not a bad thing. The reason why is because there isn't really any danger. You know, yeah. hear people talk about the lion example. You know, it's like it's a, it's a paper lion. It's not a real lion. So, but it's very real in your body. It's very real physiologically. And that physiology, again, can come out in a number of ways and it can kick off your brain into catastrophizing, worrying, you know, and, and magnifying things out of proportion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's something, you know, again, I had it. Um, and and, and I, once you just admit it, it's like you're admitting it, but it's not bad for those of you listening. Don't think it's a death sentence. It's not. It's just something you need to learn how to work with and treat it as it not being dangerous, essentially. That's the foundation that this feeling in your body, you don't need to avoid something when you have this feeling in your body or the symptom because it's anxiety. So in the same way that we can reduce our TMS physical pain symptoms, do you believe that we can reduce those um, anxiety symptoms? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Using these strategies. Um, again, the foundation is that you cannot stop your anxiety like directly when it happens, it happens in a split second. So we're really working on the back end with it. How you handle your anxiety, I think is really important. What do you what mean by working from the back end? So all of a sudden you, you get a jolt of anxiety yeah. or something, you're with somebody or someplace, you're doing something, or you get a jolt of pain that you know is an anxiety pain anxiety yeah. symptom and then you want to the first thing i tell people is to, is to call it out for what it is mm. uh, we say name it detain it name the emotion it's called affect labeling hey this is anxiety i recognize it I, this is a familiar friend right here it comes yeah. okay but then say it's it's just I, I use the word just it's just anxiety i like that word because it, mm. you know, it's not anxiety oh my god it's just anxiety. Okay, I've been here before. And then you can talk to your brain. You can reassure your brain. Um, that's one strategy. You can say, you can get stronger and say, no, you're not going to control me. I know what you are. You're just anxiety. Yeah. Because what it wants you to do is listen to it and avoid, retreat, pull back. You can get paralyzed, spin your head out more. You're trying to break that circuit. Mm. Okay. So you can do it a number of ways. Um, but you can switch the emotion. Um, you can go from being anxious to getting tapping into anger, which is that assertiveness, and we mm. call it facing it or confronting the anxiety, challenging it. I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to go do this right now. I'm going to show you that this is a false fear. Okay, you can relax into it, which I also encourage to calm down, breathe. Okay, this is just anxiety. Settle down, relax. So you can do a lot of things. Um, there's lots of methods. Um, I, I, one of the things I take from the DARE approach, if you guys have heard of that, D-A-R-E for anxiety. Mm -hmm. DARE is like, um, they have a book and an app. Uh, D stands for diffuse. So one of the techniques they say, when you're, in, when you're very anxious, your mind's going to say, what if, what if, what if yeah. this? So he says, uh, so what? So flip it around from what if to so what? And the reason you can say, so what, is it's not real danger. Yeah. If you go to the hospital with an anxiety attack, they're going to send you home. Yep. Because it's not a heart attack. Yeah. Feels like a heart attack. It feels dangerous, but it is not. So the more you can kind of come from this premise that your anxiety is not dangerous, that means the symptom is not dangerous either. It's just something from my brain. And you can start working with it that way. I think that's how you can start to to work with it um and it's slowly typically in my experience um maybe it's different for other people it's slowly it's just kind of receded for me it's it doesn't come as much less intensely i'll get it still sometimes but i know exactly what it is it doesn't trick me i don't get overwhelmed i don't get hijacked by it anymore um i call it out i let it do its thing i continue on with my day and typically it just goes away yeah I love that. I'm not going to let it trick me. 
when you so when we're talking about you know healing we're talking about feeling our emotions and there's many ways to do that everybody has their their preference of um what what works for them um but uh, in that pathway we are we are leaning into our our emotions we're allowing them we're experiencing them um we're being honest and i don't know authentic with them but then on the flip side there's also this idea of of not buying into the thoughts and and saying we're safe because we're letting we're not buying into the fear <laughs> so i think sometimes people get like wait do, why don't i just lean into the fear that's an emotion too um so can you can you talk a little bit about that difference there yeah um i mean thoughts and emotions and they're they they're they're play off each other right and mm -hmm. there's always talk what chicken or egg what comes first um, when I was looking to that, because I was curious about that, from what I could find was that actually emotion comes first. Um, be, if you think about a neonate or a child, we're much more emotionally developed than we are um, thought developed or cognitively developed. That Interesting. From... Okay, so okay. emotion precedes thought. Now, thought can cause more emotion too. So it's okay. very interesting when you think about if you start catastrophizing, Typically, that comes from fear in you. That's where catastrophizing wells up from is from the fear in you. Uh -huh. It doesn't start out of nowhere. Okay, it starts from the emotion, but you might not catch that in your body because it so quickly goes into these thoughts. Or you're ruminating about something. You don't like something bad. You're mad about something. You don't recognize that anger is driving rumination thoughts. So if you can get underneath the thoughts, I'm always bringing people back to the emotions if I can. So it's like, what's the emotion driving these thoughts? Anxiety. These are anxious thoughts. These are angry thoughts. These are sad thoughts. Or what's the emotion driving your behavior? Mm -hmm. Why are you doing that? Why, why are you behaving that way? What drives you to do that? Well, I'm, I'm fearful. I'm scared I'll be rejected. Right? I'm scared I'll be abandoned. Afraid somebody won't like me. That's why people please. Yeah. What's driving your perfectionism? Why do you do that? When I mean, you know it's not good. Well, you know, I want it to look good because it makes me feel good. Well, how do you feel if it doesn't, if it's not perfect? Well, I get upset. What's that? Well, it's anger, right? So I get frustrated, annoyed, but it's about a fear again, fear of losing control. So there's all the emotions that if you just dig in and get underneath, I say, get underneath it. Get underneath your symptom. Yeah. What what is how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. um, how does your symptom make you feel? So back to the thoughts and emotions. They they ping pong around. Um, they feed each other. So you know you want to be aware and catch your thoughts too because they are you know again amplifying emotions or amplifying symptoms. Um, so you can work on both. I tell people work on both levels, but people typically don't work on the emotional level. They're always working on the thought level only. So I encourage people to go beneath the thought. Um, but you can, you know, work with thoughts. You can, you know, I tell people just try not to believe these thoughts, catch them. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't stop them either. So studies show if you try to stop your thoughts, good luck. If they're going to come back stronger in studies, the thought rebound is real. Mm -hmm. So they come right back stronger than ever. Yeah. So, and so in that case is is your answer that's let's look at the thoughts let's observe them kind of with curiosity what interesting i'm having another fear thought okay yeah exactly that you're exactly right just curiosity detachment um we're building a mindfulness um aware which is awareness which i think is really crucial for this because if you can't see yourself your own patterns it's really hard to change them yeah Right. So cultivating a sense of mindfulness and awareness is the first step because then you can kind of see what's going on in your head and you can distance yourself from it and that separation. And that allows you to make a choice now. Oh, that's my anxiety. That's an anxious thoughts. I don't need to listen to that. But if you're not conscious, you're literally, you become the thought. Yeah, you become yes. Yes. It overtakes you. Mm hmm yeah it's like a robot so we're talking about emotional and mental 
processing here, right? So that was that was the mental or the thoughts. And when when we're looking at the emotions, what's your um, what's your favorite way? I mean, writing, somatic. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the others right now. A physical um, meditation. What's what's your way? What's your preferred method there? Yeah, um, good question. I think they're all good. Um, I think it's personal too. I'm, I've noticed that working with people, some people really love the right. Yeah. Some people absolutely hate it. They're not going to do it. <laughs> Journaling. So it's about expression. So I tell you with emotions, it's all about expression and acknowledgement and expression. So however you can express and get in touch with them is good, whether you are journaling, verbally expressing your feelings. I think verbal expression is one of the most in the world, the most common way people talk about how they feel. And is that CBT? Um, not necessarily CBT. I would say it's more emotional expression. So like, hmm. I always encourage patients, you, you use more emotional words in the way you talk because a lot of people with TMS they're more emotionally suppressive people, repressive, and they're hold everything in. They're stoic. They're not wear emotions on their sleeve people, typically. That's why they have the symptoms, right? So yeah. I would encourage you to express yourself. Hey, I, I, I feel sad. I feel hurt. Hey, that angered me. That made me upset. Yeah. If you can. Now, if I know for it's hard for people to just do that, so it takes some practice, but what you can do is acknowledge your emotions. So again, awareness first. How am I feeling? Label to yourself in your mind how you feel. And, and it's very simple. It doesn't take a lot. You can say, if I ask you the question now, audience, you're sitting here, how do you feel right now emotionally? If you don't feel settled, happy, relaxed, you feel something else. Mm -hmm. What is it you're feeling? Now, these feelings change all the time during your day. And many times people don't notice little things building up during the day like at work people are pissing them off they're getting annoyed and they're getting frustrated and irritated or anxious so yeah. you want to try to become more emotionally aware and then just use a word to yourself it's like an acknowledgement hey this is anger hey i'm feeling frustrated so that way you start to become more um, attuned to emotions so i really like that strategy as a daily strategy just to become more emotionally aware during your day mm -hmm. knowledge verbally express. If you can't say it to somebody, um, there is other strategies like journaling. Um, I work with people on imaginative expression. So you can imagine empty chair, or we call imaginative aggression, which is a stronger version of releasing anger, where you can get aggressive in your mind with somebody to release your anger if it's really strong. Um, that's helpful. Um, physical ways too, like um, if you're really sad, let the tears come if you can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you're really angry, go do something physical that can release your anger. If you're really anxious, move that can release anxiety. Yeah. So you have a lot of ways you can work with them. And I think the more tools you have, the better. Um, a lot of people I see had like, hey, I'm very into the physical expression, but now I can't exercise anymore because I have the pain. So that outlet's taken away. Now their emotions are building up more. So they need to have a better way, another outlet, another way to get in touch with their emotions. Yeah. Just a side note of an example. <laughs> this Just this last week, I had a, a couple of rough things happen to me and around me. And um, I started getting a weird symptom in my shoulder where I, I kind of went numb, like right here. And I... I stopped and asked my body, like, what, what is it that you want? <laughs> what do you want from me? And at first I thought, well, it must be that I want to punch this person, which would have been not appropriate, but it makes sense that my, like, logically, when I thought about it, that that would work, but it didn't, it didn't help my symptom at all. And I, I just paid a little bit more attention to my body and realized my body told me straight up, I, I should have just walked away. It wanted me to just mm -hmm. walk away. Um, I didn't need to be in that situation, but in the moment, I was not emotionally aware enough to know that it was even an option for me to leave scenario, right? So, right. so that's kind of the type of thing that I think we're we're talking about here is like getting in touch with what's the feeling, what's happening here. I felt demeaned. I was able to name that, 
And as soon as I, and then I, I physically set up a situation where I just um, did an analogy and I, I walked away from an inanimate object. Um, and, right. It, right. And, and immediately my, my shoulder and arm just and settled I, out. Yeah, that's perfect. That's great. Yeah, the more like you, you did, that's awesome. You can connect to the feeling. You've got a lot of options of what you can do. Yeah. Um, you can walk away. I had a lady just the other day on a call. I we went over something and she had, she said, I said, well, how do you feel about this person? I want to strangle them. I said, okay, well, can you let yourself do that? You know, even just for a moment. And, and immediately as soon as she did that, as she said, I want to shake her, she did it. And then it means she moved into grief. It switched quickly because she released the anger quickly by doing it by the impulse. And then it switched into that totally different emotion of grief that she'd been hurt terribly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then we could just feel that. So with anger, like you alluded to, you can walk away. That's a choice. You can confront and stand up for yourself and be a servant and say something. Um, you can do a lot of things, right? So it's just what's appropriate, what seems right, what you asked yourself, what was wanting to do, what was appropriate. Yeah. So yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. Um, and I and I've noticed you do some. I believe you do some somatic. Yes, I didn't talk work. About that um, can you just explain to people, in your words, what what somatic means? Because everybody has their own. Well, there's different types yeah. of somatic therapy. So, what does that mean for you? Yeah. So, actually, back to your original question, I like somatic work um, as an expression for emotion. Um, yeah. uh, somatic work for me is just keep it very simple. If you were just to stop what you're doing and go and tune into your body what do you feel and you just let those feelings come forth no sort of like searching for something special or trying to find something magical or miss missed emotion or something like that you're just sitting with yourself and if you sit with yourself and open up and just like take down your guard and surrender things will come up yeah. sensations feelings symptoms and you just simply want to allow that stuff to surface and think of it as an expression or as a release of from your subconscious mind and your body of something. Yeah. And as it unfolds, it releases and changes and moves and shifts. So there's a way to go about it. And that's kind of what I do in the class, like set the right environment in yourself to allow that to happen, not be overwhelmed by it or shut down to it. And to see it in the right way so that it can be sort of digested in your system or processed. Yeah. Yeah. We've just done so much suppressing that we need to make the space to allow it, to confess it, to get it out, to, to acknowledge it. Um, so that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. Okay. Well, I'm going to close with a few questions that people have, if that's all right. Um, first, any thoughts on tinnitus? I've had it for three years. Is tinnitus TMS? Yes, uh, tinnitus is TMS. Uh, any symptom can be TMS. Uh, again, depends on the history, the length of time you've had it. Three years is a long time. So I would say that it's probably TMS. I don't know your history or the person's history, but um, I would probably say that is TMS because most tendonitis goes away in a reasonable period of time if it's structural. And I want to clarify that I said tinnitus, ringing in the ears. No. Oh, tinnitus. Sorry, not tinnitus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, tinnitus. Well, that is also TMS. Okay. Uh, very, 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 very common symptom, actually. So tinnitus is something I see a lot, too. Um, yeah, it's a very classic symptom of TMS, typically yeah. of nervous system stress. I know that this person, I've talked to this person, um, and they are stuck in this process. Do you have any suggestion for people stuck in the healing process? Yeah, um, I would say um, ask some questions to them. Um, how do you handle that symptom? Um, are you reacting to it, You know, creating a secondary reaction? Mm -hmm. Are you um, seeing it as potential just a stress symptom? Um, are you looking at the underlying emotions that might be generating it? Um, how are you yeah, how are you working with it? And maybe there are some answers there to where you're feeling stuck or not seeing some progress. 
Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm not stuck on the fear of damage, but I'm stuck with the fear of the pain. How do I interrupt that? Yeah. So with the pain, and that's very, very, very common that people's uh, fear is around their symptom getting worse. Yeah. Not they they'll say, yeah, it's, I don't think it's dangerous, Jim. I think it's, you know, TMS, but I just really have a hard time with this pain. So what we're trying to do when we do the somatic work, at least, is practice what's called the affect tolerance. It's this ability to tolerate the feeling. Okay, so the pain, if it's not structural, um, it is a stress pain or emotional pain, probably, uh, or central sensitization is called in your brain. So we need to first come from that understanding on a cognitive level and try to keep that here so we don't get overwhelmed by the pain. But at the same time, we have the understanding that it's okay. We literally have to be able to sit with it. Okay, so there's a tolerance piece to it. So it's not enough just to say it's okay. It's not dangerous. That only takes you so far. The other half is you got to be okay being with the symptom and letting, what I tell people, you have to actually let that symptom do whatever it wants as in a form of expression to release, to dissipate. We have, we're so programmed to stop these symptoms, to fix them, to make them go away. But if it's an emotional symptom, what you're doing is suppressing it. You're actually pushing it down by wanting it to stop. The pain is tough. I know it's hard to feel pain. It is very difficult. Emotional pain is very strong too. Um, sends people to the hospital, these things, but um, right. And and if you have a history of trauma or a history of um adverse events and and you're a highly sensitive person which most people are with tms you really feel it strongly and it can easily overwhelm your system so you want to build this ability it's called window of tolerance too so we have affect tolerance and window of tolerance that you can keep this window open in yourself to what you feel and let it move through your body try to be open to it just it sometimes will get worse before it gets better but just know it's like a wave that like will crash over eventually and subside. Yeah. So, yeah, that's part of the work we do with people, right? Or I do with people is to build up this ability to handle what they're feeling in their body. Yeah. That, that tolerance um, just reminds me of also the tolerance we have to build to experience emotions that we just don't really want to. Um, sometimes we suppress the emotions because they feel dangerous. We've been taught or learned or culture or shame has taught us that we shouldn't feel anger or fear or anything. Um, but there's also, I think, a piece of it that's just not very much fun to be angry. And so no, it's not fun. <laughs> Nobody said it was. It's not fun. But yeah. the healing, I always tell people, I feel like the healing comes when you can authentically be okay with that feeling or symptom or pain in your body and yeah. then you can allow it to be felt on a felt sense is really truly feeling your feelings at a deep level and that is really healing when you can allow yourself to go to that place that's what i'm going to call this this episode the healing comes when dot 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 because that's <laughs> that's the money right there yeah yeah and combining the two things a lot of people and you know this and they're in their heads and so they're working on an intellectual level only yeah. And that does take you, can get you pretty far, but at some point you've got to be able to face your feelings. And again, to know your feelings are mostly just emotions. They're not dangerous, but again, emotions can be perceived as dangerous. They're too strong. They're too much. I don't have a bad relationship with the anger. I've been hurt before many reasons, right? So we're trying to reconceptualize that, Hey, emotions are normal. All humans have them. Yeah. You have them for the rest of your life. So the sooner you can get comfortable with them, the better off you're going to be. I saw this post on Instagram that was like a challenge to feel every emotion today. Pay attention to when you feel the anger and the fear and the shame and, and try to allow them all in a day. That's and awesome. see, you know, I thought that was pretty great. I was like, yeah, that's right. I definitely have a full range of emotions all day long and if i'm not you. well <laughs> if not you're a robot yeah and i've probably hit under a rock all day and i still feel lonely so <laughs> right exactly you can't run from them i would tell me you can't fight them you don't fight your feelings you know what's that song i can't fight these feelings anymore yeah 
Uh, you can't run. You can run, but you can't hide. They're going to fight. They're going to come out. So you might as well just say, all right, yeah. let me just see what's here. And, and they come out in the form of a symptom. And that's it. So if you not have a good relation with them, most likely they come out in the form of a symptom. You're not going to think it's an emotion. That's what's called a repressed emotion. Yeah. So you want to get underneath it. And, you know, I had such, um, that my anxiety was so bad around conflict growing up. So meaning I had a hard time with anger. That's what that means when you're yeah. conflict avoidant. It was so bad for me when I was younger. I would have to turn the radio off when people were having a debate or just like oh. challenging, that's how bad it was in me. I couldn't even hear that. So you yeah. talk about suppression. I would just turn it off. I would avoid it. And obviously that didn't work, right? Didn't yeah. go away. But now I don't I can think it doesn't bother me at all, but I've gotten much better in, in relationship with all my emotions. Like you said, emotional challenge, challenge all your listeners to say, can I be okay with every emotion? Yeah every flavor like ice cream I, you know i i don't like strawberry ice cream well see if you can eat some of that <laughs> <laughs> strawberry okay. ice cream is terrible so not gonna gonna kill a you. good one strawberry ice cream's not going to kill you yeah and so you know it's if you don't feel it that's what hurts you when you don't ex acknowledge it and feel it yeah absolutely um and, it, and it's interesting, just this conversation is bringing up all these examples. I was in a law, I work part time at a high school and I was in a lockdown for a, a bomb threat, um, but I'm in a position of authority. And so I had to hold myself as if I was not afraid, right? So I was stuck in a gym with 400 seniors and um, objectively it was terrifying right? But yeah. I held it together and pretended that I was not afraid, stood in front of these kids and never dealt with it, right? Mm -hmm. Because then I just left school and thought I made it through that and I was strong and I never allowed myself to, to recognize the absolute truth that it was scary. It was scary to be in that situation. Yeah. So I think sometimes it's not even necessarily and it, like, there's just so many ways that we can suppress our emotions that when you start doing this work, you start seeing, okay, I, I it wasn't wrong that I kept myself under control. That was the right thing right. to do. But then to later have time with myself and I'm a Christian. So with God and just be like, that was scary. Right. And this is how that would have, should have, and does feel in my body right. um, because of reality. That's right. No, you're right. And sometimes it's, we have to suppress it in that situation, or it's not appropriate, we'll be in trouble if we yell at the boss at work, um, yeah. you know, or X, Y, Z. And so, or even as, as kids, I mean, how much do we have to suppress because you'll get in trouble yeah. go to your room? So it's, it, there, it, there's an advantage to, to doing that in the moment, but unfortunately, like animals in the wild, when they've been attacked and they play dead, they will just literally shake it off afterwards. We don't do that. We just carry on yeah nothing happened and that's where we get in trouble so the recognition that's great you did that you just let yourself go back and acknowledge and feel how you felt yeah. um yeah i love that animal shaking off thing i actually use that at times when i i know i need to recognize i made it through that thing it's over i'm safe and i will do a physical animal shaking of it off to move on yeah, that's fantastic. That's a good, that's another good one you can use. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of moving on, let's, let's go through these fast. Um, what is the best way to know if someone is dealing with structural caused pain versus neuroplastic pain? Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, evidence. Okay. So like, I, I don't want to like, I'm, when I'm doing my work, I'm still a health professional. I'm not trying to just uh, be a faith healer mm -hmm. and say, oh, you have GMS necessarily i need evidence first before we move on so it's like give me your history look at everything okay um how did it start was there a physical injury um yes or no that doesn't mean right away that it's structural if it's yes how long have you had it is it gone on beyond the normal time frame for healing in the body that's a clue that it's you know was there six months six months yeah three to six months Okay. Um, unless you have had something really bad, like a complete tear of a muscle or something like that. 
take you longer, but you'd be getting better, you know, over that time. Um, okay. uh, was there anything happening at the time that was stressful when the symptoms started? That's a real simple question. Emotional, stressful, life change, something different out of the ordinary, um, a lot of extra stress. Okay, do you have a history of anxiety? Mm -hmm. Do you have a, had any adverse childhood events, traumas, um, other traumas, PTSDs, things like that, that have happened in your life prior to that? Have you had other symptoms before too in your body that could be stress-related? Um, tell me what they are. Um, tell me about your parents. So I want to be broad, but tell me how you grew up. I want a huge picture. I want to know who you are as a person. Tell me about your personality. Do you Are you having some things that Dr. Sarno talks about? And then based on everything I've written down and everything they've shared, let's make a diagnosis here. Yeah. Okay. Look at everything we can find. Give me your MRI reports. Tell me what the doctor told you. So that's how you do it. And hopefully looking at that, people will say, yeah, okay, yes. A lot of people still need more convincing, right? They, mm -hmm. they Even if I have a guy now, it's incredible. Um, hopefully he's not listening, but um, <laughs> he probably wouldn't care anyway. He He's a lawyer, so he's he's very analytical guy, you know, and He's been told, not by me, he's been told by another TMS physician. He's been told by his other physiotherapist who said he saw 5,000 pelvic pain patients. He's never seen anything like this. This is not, not fit the mold of a structural problem. He's had countless MRIs. He's had a recent visit to the doctor. And he's still not convinced. And he'll come up, well, maybe they're missing this little piece. And by the way, he has a major history of anxiety. Yeah. And I keep gently pointing him back to that. Hey, you know, this is anxiety. Yeah. Your symptom. So, but it can take time. Yeah. And it's because, and those of you listening, your pain feels structural. It, it does. And, and that's why it's so easy to not want to, or not, I don't know, accept easily that it's CMS because, and I think Jim and I can both attest to that, that it, it, we understand why it takes a, a bit to get over that hump and understand it's TMS, but we've all had that experience where it, it's like, this can't be emotional. It feels so structural and mechanical. Um, it's truly incredible. And the more, I don't know about you, but the more I've done this work, I've really reflected on Dr. Sarno. I was like, oh my God, he, he figured this out. It's, yeah. I feel yeah. like the personality is the same. It's the same kind of people get these things. Yep. We don't see the emotion. We maybe have, we're not fully um, aware of our emotions as a person. Um, and we just don't see it. It's solely missed. It yeah. is repressed. And people will tell me all the time, I listen to the story and I go, oh my God, you should be so angry about that. Yeah. Well, I don't feel angry. What about that migraine you got right now? Yeah. <laughs> that back pain. Yeah. So, But there's zero connection between emotion and symptoms. Yeah. yeah. Super interesting. Very interesting. Um, okay. Uh, this might have, maybe I should have attached this to the bottom of the last button, but how do you handle a patient that has a diagnosis of fibromyalgia, which I had as one of my million? Yeah. Well, it's TMS. Um, it's classic TMS. That's like yeah. really one of the ones because there's nothing that you can find. Um, so when, the way I treat all these symptoms um, for you guys who are listening, this is the same way. Yeah. And that's what I love about the work. It's not complex. You can put in a hundred symptoms into this basket and it's TMS. So in my mind, in my brain, in your brain, you're treating them the same way that you would treat IBS, that you treat chronic fatigue, interstitial cystitis, all sorts of pains. I mean, yeah. tinnitus, it goes on and on and on. So I would treat it exactly the same way. I don't look at the structure, look at the body. Let's go to the brain. Let's see what's going on for you. What emotions you have. What's been your history? How did this start? Um, try to put together a picture and look at themes too. Like another thing you can look at are what are these um, emotional themes? So like present moment triggers. Does that have a theme to your past to when you're growing up? Yeah. So that's helpful too. Yeah. Um, but I treat it all the same. So I don't delineate. I get people, the reason I'm saying this, I get people asking me the same question. You never talked about that symptom. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's because we all want to know that our symptom can be healed. Right. <laughs> yes. Right. 
Okay, one last question. What role should physical therapy play if you understand that your chronic pain is primarily a mind-body issue and that the body physical issues are more being driven by processes in your brain? Should someone still continue with physical therapy if they need to focus on doing some of the mental emotional work to heal from the chronic pain? Yeah, good question. Yeah, I don't say that um, I haven't fully abandoned my profession. So I would say, yes, physical therapy is good if you can go from the idea that, look, your condition is from your brain, it's neuroplastic, and you're going to physical therapy to get over fear avoidance, let's say, or yeah. to build up strength, or just to get your life back, that you have a hard time doing that on your own because you're not being pushed or monitored. So Motivated. find the right physical therapist who, because there's a lot of physical therapists now who do understand this, at least from the idea of there's nothing wrong with you. It's sensation. Yeah. And so it can be helpful. Great. I love that. Yeah. We sometimes we need that little bit of help with the motivation. So absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any um, final words? And then where can we find you? Um, a little bit maybe about your group therapy, anything you'd like to share with us about what you do? Sure. Yeah. Final word would be very simply if you get the diagnosis you're fine. You're structurally fine. Try to focus on your emotions. Try to focus on some of the stuff in the brain, nervous system. Um, that's simple. Uh, as far as me, um, yeah, you can go to my website, uh, thepainpt.com. Mm -hmm. I have a YouTube channel called The Same Thing, The Pain PT. Um, you'll find information on my website about one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have a group thing I do on Wednesdays right now. I may add another day. Um, right now it's 8.30 to 10 in the morning, West Coast time. Okay. Weekly, and we're in our second month. That you can join at any time. It's been really great. People are really enjoying it. They're getting a lot out of it. They're learning to tap into their feelings, and we yeah. go through an hour and a half of different practices. Wow. And questions um, through chat. So I keep it very like because time goes fast. Um, we're not really talking. People can answer ask questions, but. Um, I'll answer them, but we really want to dive into the body. So we're doing a lot of somatic practices, a couple of them during that time. Okay, cool. Um, I was telling Jim before we started this call that I've gotten a couple emails since um, posting that, that Jim was going to be on this podcast and just people saying that just your YouTube channel and your videos have been incredibly helpful for people to just really put all the pieces together and really understand what is happening, especially people who are in the beginning of the, of the journey of healing. So thank you for all the work you are doing. It's definitely making um, big differences in people's lives. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'll keep doing it. I'm trying to just help get the word out there. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. And as far as watchers go, I will see you guys next week. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.